Wow, Tom 33. Man, could this be Tom Monroe? This is Troy Burns, man. I think I found your disc. Awesome, bring it on up. So when did you get your first Frisbee? Hard to say when I got my first one. I remember seeing people playing the first time and that was at uh, Scripps Laboratory in La Jolla, California. Uh, my father was on special assignment uh, in aerospace business and I went to high school out there for about a year and we'd go to the beach every now and then. I saw these two guys playing catch with this plate or whatever. It went down and, hey, what's going on? And we started playing catch a little bit and, oh, that was cool. Where I lived in California, it was all about skateboards. And we were just making our own skateboards. This is before they were selling in stores. We were taking roller skates apart, putting them on a piece of two by four and riding down the street. And it just so happened that the, the sidewalks would go on for miles and miles and miles. And you heard the song, Sidewalk Surfing. So we moved back to Huntsville and I'm pretty sure I brought the first skateboard to Alabama in like 64, 63, 64. And nothing ever happened. I was hoping, you know, somebody would make them and sell them, but it, no, it didn't happen. Anyway, go through high school. I'm a baseball player all my life. Get to college and I have a roommate from Seattle. He had a big Frisbee and he and I would, would play catch in, the, in our parking lot next to the apartment. And we'd try to outdo each other doing tricks. Well, I went back and forth from Florence to Atlanta to make money to pay for the last year of college and then try to save up some for the next year. And uh, WQXI radio having the great Frisbee fly-in. This is in 73, and there were about a thousand people at Grant Park. And we competed in um, distance and accuracy. And I won both of them. I'm thinking, oh, I really like baseball, but I'm really good at this too. <laughs> I go back to college and I'm living with this girl in college and I'm playing frisbee by myself all the time. You know? And then she got all mad at me one day and says, well, if you like throwing those things so much, why don't you just get a job with that company? And I went, whoa, what an idea. <laughs> so I write a letter to Whammo, they write me back, one thing leads to another and I end up in California. Um, walking into Ed Hedrick's office and meeting him. He's telling me all these plans he has for people like me who love to play Frisbee. And one of the things he said was, Tom, what I want to see is guys like you can make a living out of playing Frisbee. And I said, yeah, I'd like to see that too. And then he told me, um, we just had the first world championship at the Rose Bowl. And I said, well, shoot, Ed, if I'd have known about that, I would have gone. I would have come out here. I said, son, you have to be invited. You just can't come. I said, I'll be here next year. And I got the tour of Whammo and, you know, the water wiggles, the super balls, the hula hoops, you know, and the Frisbees. And after um, work was over, he took me to Pasadena where he lived. And right down the street was uh, La Cañada, which is called Oak Grove Park and he already had metal poles in the ground. He hadn't figured out to put the baskets and the chains on them yet. So we played Frisbee golf hitting these metal poles. And then I became the director of the International Frisbee Association for the Southeast. And it was my job to start a Frisbee tournament in all the Southern states. So in 75, I'm invited to the world championship. And um, by then he's invented the target. And so we played the first world championship with disc golf targets. The disc pole hole is what he called them. You know, it just took off from there. And it, it, I was his man in the South. And he had like a guy in every part of the country. It was like a giant sales marketing outfit. One of my jobs was to get these tournaments started in all the Southern states. As it turned out, I was pretty good at doing the tricks and everything. And while I met with Ed, he suggested strongly that I go see Victor Malafrani and John Kirkland as they were touring with the Globetrotters. So I went to uh, Memphis and uh, saw their show, halftime show, at the Globetrotters show, which of course was packed, and they just brought down the house. I mean, they're making all these incredible throws and catches, and I'm going, I can do that. I want to do that. <laughs> Let me in. <laughs> and so I go backstage and talk to them. And, they showed me how to do the nail delay where you spin it on your finger and it had just been invented. And Kirkland says, this is the next big thing in freestyle. 
If you don't learn this, you can't freestyle. About a month or two later, they were in Atlanta. So I go see them in Atlanta. And I learned how to do the nail delay where you spin it on your fingers. I've never seen anybody learn it that fast. This is crazy. With the help of Whammo, we formed the Florence Frisbee team, the FFT. We got a little travel money from them. And so we started going to tournaments around the country, meeting all these people that are like-minded, like us. You know, it's like going to your first rock concert and see everybody else has long hair and you only knew 10 people with long hair and now there's hundreds of them. You know, it's like all oh, these people love Frisbee like I do. This is great. I was already the Southeastern Regional Director for the International Frisbee Association. And um, so I met some other guys that were the regional directors around the country. And Dan Roddick, who was the main man up in the Northeast, who later became the director of the International Frisbee Association, suggested that I come out with a newsletter for the Southeast, and I did. It was called the South's Sailing Circular, and it cost like five bucks a year to get it. And that was the main clearinghouse for all the information of all the Frisbee tournaments and all the results that were going on in the Southeast. You know, from that point on, things just started rolling. One of the biggest weeks I had, and I rode my motorcycle from Florence, spent the night in Atlanta, went to Jacksonville, Florida, and rode back home. And I said, look, I can't be doing these Frisbee shows on my motorcycle. I need that van. Let me have it. And so I bugged them every day for like six months. And they finally said, go pick out a van and send us the invoice. <laughs> we would bring everybody into the gym, crank up the rock music, start doing the tricks, and then do some show and tell and bring some members of the audience out to play guts. It just went over great. A lot of people told us it was the great best assembly program they had ever had. There was freezing cold and snow on the ground, but we're playing Frisbee at least three times a day. And then in the spring, we became involved with the uh, College Union Association of Entertainment. And we were an act, just like any rock and roll act, that the college would bring to their annual spring fling. Every college has a spring week. I continued to do that until I ran out of people that could do those Frisbee tricks with me. <laughs> and then I got married and didn't travel so much anymore. So what was it like working with Ed Hedger? Ed was a genius. Um, he was the kind of person who made and lost three or four fortunes um, because he would invest in his ideas. He had over 20 U.S. patents. Uh, one of his was the first ATV tire to run flat. Hmm. One of his biggest inventions, as, as far as size go, was he invented an oil skimming barge that would go to an oil spill. Like, remember Valdez and, mm -hmm. and okay, well he sent his barge up there and this barge would skim oil off the surface of the water and then burn it at the same time. And then of course he invented the um, the flight rings on the Frisbee, you know, those little grooves. Okay. And um, the patent said that they were concentrically designed circles to enhance the flight. But as we found out later, the only thing they were good for was holding dirt. Okay. Yes. But nobody else could make them because you know, he had the patent on that and no one else could put Frisbee because they had a trademark on the name Frisbee. And then of course he invented the target. It took him like 20 different times to figure out how to put a circle on top of the pole and a basket underneath and the chain so you could come in from any direction. And that's gone through uh, several patent changes now. Every time Ed's patent would run out, somebody would make one just like the one that ran out. He was kind of like a, a, a big brother slash father figure. He'd call me on the phone every now and then and cuss me out and I'd cuss him out and then he'd call me back two or three days later and like, what's going on Monroe? <laughs> and he'd send me discs. I've got discs with little notes from him and said, uh, Tom, try this out and let me know what you think. Um, and we spoke frequently on the phone and of course he was always you know, urging me to get out and sell some more courses and I sold as many as I could. No, nobody heard about it back then. Anyway, we, we designed the course, and then I went back a few weeks later to put the course in, and I found a couple of good old boys to help me down there. And these boys had managed to burn up the tractor. The wheels had melted, the steering wheel had melted. These were the kind of guys that would work for 20 minutes and then, you know, take a 10 minute break. And I don't even think the owner knew it was burned up yet. So um, we designed the course and that was 
the site of the very first PDGA tournament. Now, uh, the confusing part is that that was on Labor Day weekend, and our tournament was Saturday and Sunday, two-day tournament. Okay. Well, on Labor Day, which was the following Monday, they had a tournament up in uh, New York, and Ed was there. So he was bragging to everybody that this here is the first PDJ tournament. I said, no, ours was on Saturday, yours was on Monday. There's only one first one, and we were the first one. You were the second one. So let's get that straight. And it's taken years to make that happen. But he's finally acknowledged it. Finally acknowledged it. Yeah. Okay. He sold a couple courses that had these dome tops, and they were wired so you could put a couple light bulbs up inside. Okay. And then the wire went underground, so you could have nine holes or 18 lit up at night. And so he took the regular Frisbee and he pumped it up with glow-in-the-dark material, phosphorus, and that made it extra heavy. The idea was you went to the T sign, which had a gooseneck lamp on it, hold your Frisbee up, charge it, throw it out through the dark to the target that's out there that's lit up, and you play Frisbee at night. So that was the first discharger. You're right. <laughs> And the players realized that these discs with the glow-in-the-dark stuff on it flew really good. And that's what we want. The Midnight Flyers were extra heavy, so they went further than anything else. You might say that was the first disc golf disc. And then the puppy came out and put the Midnight Flyers out of business. <laughs> but that's another story. Still throwing the puppy. Still throwing oh, the puppy yeah, today. Yeah, yeah, this is the best putter ever made. I mean, I've suggested to Discraft to just make a smaller Ultrastar. I said, all you have to do is shrink it down to 21 centimeters. It'll be just like a puppy, and he never would do it. He made the, he made the Rattler. I mean, if you wanted to buy a disc close to a puppy, that's probably the closest one out there right now. DGA was, was the, the manufacturing arm. PDGA was Ed Hedrick's baby. He invented it all, basically. And his intentions were good but he was also quite the businessman. And so he, 82 worlds, everybody threw the Midnight Flyers. Well, in 83, the puppy came out, and then Innova came out with their first disc, which was called the Eagle, later changed to the Arrow. And Discraft came out with a, a Sky Streak, a unbreakable golf disc that was shaped like this, except it was just a little bit bigger a little more aer aerodynamic and probably flew a little further, but you couldn't break it. It was, it was like the first candy plastic. And Ed wanted us to tell everybody, oh, no, no, you have to use Whammo discs. And we said, oh, no, no, no. We're not going to use Whammo discs. We're going to let everybody use anything they want. And he said, well, you're not going to have the PDJ World Championship then. And we said, well, we're going to have a world championship. And if you want it to be called PDGA, you're going to have to let us throw the, all these other discs. But, you know, we had put everything into place. We already had this logo. Um, we had invitations had been sent out. And we were not backing down. And sure enough, he relinquished. And then the next year, 84 World in Rochester, there was a symbolic transfer of power from him to Ted Smithers, who became the director of the PDGA, and they, he handed him a, a beer uh, to transfer the power <laughs> from Ed running the show to now uh, an association, and Ed asked me to be on the, the board of directors, uh, even though I was the main one against him. He also had a blacklist. If he didn't like you, he put you on a blacklist and you couldn't buy any discs from me anymore. <laughs> I don't know if I ever made the blacklist or not. But, <laughs> he but, might have skated towards it. Yeah, <laughs> I, was, I probably skated around it. <laughs> Ed and I were pretty good friends, even though we didn't see each other, but we talked on the phone a lot. And they need somebody to drive Ed around in a golf cart. And, uh, get Monroe! Yeah. <laughs> and so, by then, we're knocking a few back. And I'm driving Ed Hedrick, you know, the inventor of this sport, around in, the, in a golf cart. And he's hollering at people, out of the way, Hall of Fame, coming through, coming through, Hall of Fame, coming through. Everybody's going, what? <laughs> Just, he had me in stitches for like two hours. <laughs> when Ed had his stroke in Miami, he, he went to the Amateur World Championships while the 
Pro World Championships were going on in Texas. And, and word got to us immediately that Ed had a stroke. He's in the hospital in Miami. So LeVon Wolf and I went out in the parking lot. We called DGA. We got the phone number for the hospital down in Miami and got his uh, daughter on the phone who I'd met before. And she said, well, he can't really talk. And well, tell him Tom and LeVon called to say hi and wish him well. She said, well, it, it brought a smile to his face. And he kind of you know, tried to make a little gesture. And then they flew him back to um, California where he died. It, it, we, we owe a lot to Ed Hedrick just for what he did and continued to do. And he believed in us. That was the big thing. He believed in these guys out here doing this. When Ed Hedrick died, uh, he wanted his ashes uh, to put in some discs. So we had them put in a golf disc and an ultimate disc. And this is one of those golf discs. And you can pull it up on YouTube. It was on Ripley's Believe It or Not, um, Ed Hedrick's Ashes. Hey there, John Ketchum. If you're like me, you fear those fairways full of trees built by sadistic pros to make their competitors bogey. Well, I'm proud to present to you the newest product to revolutionize the sport of disc golf, Ching's Organic Tree Repellent. Ching's Organic Tree Repellent gives you the confidence you need to take on those tricky shots through the forest on all those leftover land courses we all love to play. With just one dose of Ching's Organic Tree Repellent, your disc will turn through the course and get you closer to the pin every time. Not be fooled though, all tree repellents aren't the same. Ching's Organic Tree Repellent is made 100% organic from the finest ingredients and now gluten free. It's the only tree repellent guaranteed not to work every time. Ching's Organic Tree Repellent. I spray that shit on everything. What are some of your favorite highlights from your career in big sports? Well, um, that TRC world record in 79 that um, uh, put me in the Guinness Book. And the next day, they sent a famous celebrity out to interview me, Bruce Jenner. <laughs> I know it's funny now, but he was straight Bruce <laughs> at the time. <laughs> yes, yes. It, was, it, it was a big deal. And uh, it was live and it was on, uh, back then there were only three networks, ABC, and you know, and it was on every network um, during the morning shows. They all had a morning show and, and they all carried it. Uh, along with, you know, having the honor of being in the Guinness Book, I got $2,500 and promptly went home and bought a new motorcycle. How many, how many courses do you think you planted in your career? The best, I've tried to make a list of it and I didn't even start making a list until a few years ago, but I think it's around 50. The parks director, uh, Miss Tammy Perry, uh, suggested that I start the Tom Monroe Trail of uh, courses that I've designed. You could come in from Georgia, hit Heflin, come on across, go north up to Birmingham, go to uh, Coleman, Arab, Moulton, come back down to Birmingham, uh, go out towards Livingston, University of West Alabama, then south on 65 and hit the University in Montgomery, then head south to Bruton, and that's on the way to the beach and uh, there's some more that have uh, come and gone over the years. Once you put a course in and you're paid for it and do the design, that's the end of your control over it. You know, They may change it, they may pull it up and put it someplace else, um, but there's lots of things that can happen after you leave. The big thing, and this goes back to Ed, is making the sale of the targets and then getting them in the ground. And, and if things work out, you get paid to make the sale and then you're paid to do the design. We have a, a course design association around the country that we have about 50 members and we all adhere to the same basic policies and procedures of uh, safety, um, difficulty, ease of play, flow, you know, all the things that make a good course we all try to do whenever we get a piece of land. A lot of the times you don't get a great piece of land. A lot of the times you get the land that's left over after they've built the whole park. There's the soccer fields, there's a the restroom, there's a the parking lot. Oh, and we've got a few acres back over here that the cows are still on. Can you put a course in up there? <laughs> so that's why a lot of courses uh, are not great because the piece of land's no good. 
So you have to make the best with what you have to work with. Oh, even though our course here in Birmingham is great, it's uh, rolling hills, and to do anything like ball fields, you have to cut down all these trees and bring in dirt and flatten it, and it's just way too much trouble. The city of Birmingham has not paid one cent for anything that's out here. People like you and I, club members over the years, have put everything in the ground. We've paid for all the targets, all the tee pads, all the signs, the bridges, everything that's, that we're playing on was paid for by the club. I go to the Parks and Recreation Show every year and try to sell disc golf to parks departments, oh, that's uh, fantastic. churches, private schools, you know, any place where they have space to put a course in, that's where a course needs to go. And it's always the same story. Well, next fiscal year, we'll put it into the budget, but as long as people keep trying, disc golf is growing exponentially every year. I've also witnessed a trend that parks and cities like to use disc golf as a method to clean up problem parks where they have elements of crime or things going on that they don't want going on in the park. This course and Redan are good examples of that. When we first started playing up here, we'd find uh, needles and all kinds of nasty things in the parking lot on Saturday and Sunday morning. And uh, during the week, there'd be a undesirable element hanging out in the parking lot but as more and more people play and we have the perfect configuration called the double loop nine out nine in you know oh, okay it's like a, like a figure eight and it's cleaned it up amazingly and I, the neighborhood has taken note of that when uh, i was in college um, my roommate dated uh, donna of the grateful dead and i dated her best friends and then everything fell apart and we didn't see those girls for a while. And then one day we saw Brenda and said, well, how about Donna? We hadn't seen y'all around in a long time. Well, she married this piano player and she's in this band called the Grateful Dead. And we went to Grateful, what? They wouldn't let the Grateful Dead play in Birmingham. The mayor said, we're not having those hippies in this town. And so they um, played in Tuscaloosa for the first time they ever played in Alabama. The next thing you know, we're backstage hanging out with the Grateful Dead. They invited us to go on the road with them, but me and my uh, friend were going to a Frisbee tournament in Sarasota the next day. So we had to leave the concert in Tuscaloosa and drive all the way to Sarasota all night long <laughs> for the tournament. <laughs> uh, in the beginning, you know, it was pretty much a hippie culture thing. Um, and the PDGA realized that and, and they knew that if it was gonna grow, they had to make a better presentation for the cameras. So one of the first thing they do when they told us, all right, you gotta wear a collared shirt at the World Championships because you never know when somebody's gonna take a picture of you or the, the a film crew is gonna be looking. In 93 at the World Championships in Huntsville, Pizza Hut sponsored it okay. and they uh, filmed the whole thing and ESPN played it for the next year off and on at different times and they did a really good job. They had a flyover of the course in the Space and Rocket Center at the very beginning. So you knew this is in Huntsville, Alabama because there's a Saturn V sticking way up above the buildings <laughs> and that's a good video to watch the 93 Worlds. I mean every big tournament now you can pretty much uh, sit in front of your TV screen and watch it live. You know, you're, you're streaming right off, right off the internet and you no know, telling how many people are sneaking around watching those at work while they should be working too. <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, I'm, uh, I'll have that report ready soon. Man, look at that putt. It's becoming more and more ingrained into the culture as a professional sport, which is, it deserves to be. This is what it looks like when you're trying to hit a really big putt. Uh, it looks like the basket's moving around and your arm is shaking. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. <laughs>
Woo! <laughs> 